Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Diana, for the uh, invitation to, to, to uh, present to this group today. I've, I've been watching some of the uh, live streams uh, from time to time, and uh, it, now I, I see the very esteemed group of people here. And it, what's really cool is after 20 years of working, I know a lot of you, and that's really nice. Uh, but thanks for the invitation to come. Uh, today I'm going to uh, try to review what it's kind of a complicated organization and process and history. Uh, but uh, I, I throw a lot of pretty pictures in. So hopefully at least you can look at the pictures because we've got a wonderful place to celebrate here in Lancaster, New York counties. Um, and I'm going to be presenting to you about the Susquehanna National Heritage Area, which is both a place, Lancaster, New York counties together, and an organization, our nonprofit organization that that manages work in both counties. And we have been about connecting people to the Susquehanna River uh, for most of the last 10, 12 years. Uh, but we also work, have worked and plan to work beyond the river too, uh, to share our heritage uh, that we, the wonderful rich heritage, natural and cultural heritage we have in Lancaster, New York counties. So um, first pretty picture, sunset just the other night on the Susquehanna. So <laughs> It's always pretty on the Susquehanna. Um, there we go. So first of all, who are we? Um, we are a nonprofit organization organized in 2001 uh, to be first the state designated nonprofit management entity for the Pennsylvania heritage area that was designated to include Lancaster and New York counties in 2001. The Pennsylvania heritage area program has been around since I think 1989. Uh, there are 12 Pennsylvania heritage areas across the state. We were the 10th designated. Uh, Pennsylvania has a process for uh, local communities, two or more counties. We have two. The Lumber Heritage Area has 15. I don't know how they do it. They got like one and a half people. <laughs> so, uh, but there are, there are 10 heritage areas across the, the country. And it really starts at the grassroots. It started with people in Lancaster and York counties coming together to say, we have a really rich heritage here. Despite the river and the concept of it being a divider, we also are united by some shared history and some shared culture, and we would like to seek a, national, a state heritage area designation. The Pennsylvania uh, Heritage Area Program is managed through the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation Natural Resources, uh, and it's a program that uh, just took it right off the website so you could say it correctly. It's a multi-region, asset-based economic development program rooted in the Commonwealth's rich natural, cultural, and industrial history. Harry Jerry's create cross-sector partnerships that enhance a region's sense of place and, very importantly, strengthen regional economies. So it's really about looking at the heritage of state importance in, in the counties that are seeking designation and using those uh, stories of history and heritage and place to bring economic development to those regions through heritage and outdoor tourism and community revitalization. And again, we were designated in 2001. So we, been around as an organization for 20 years. We actually geared up with staff in 2003. Uh, so I was the first employee and I'm still here. <laughs> Whether folks like it or not, I've stuck around. But it's really wonderful work and it's really rewarding and that's one of the reasons. And I want to let you know uh, that when I interviewed for this job, uh, that, that was interviewed in York and Lancaster, and first interview was in York. And I grew up in York, my family's in York, and they said, hey, you've got all these strong connections to York, how are you gonna reach out to Lancaster? I said, well, I think I'm going to live there. And that's what I, I've done. Ever since I moved back to take this job in 2003, we lived in Mannheim Township. I didn't tell them that my wife, who was from North Carolina, uh, when I told her about the job and said, I really want to get this job, she said, well, look, if you're going to get it, we're going to live in Lancaster because I want 20 minutes between you and your family. <laughs> she loves my family, <laughs> but she likes that 20 minutes. <laughs> they generally call before they show up. Uh, so that's what we did. But it actually worked out great because... Uh, Having grown up in New York, I obviously came to Lancaster a lot, but living in the community for 20 years has really given me the roots and our, our two children the roots here in Lancaster County too. So we've been in Pennsylvania Heritage Area for 20 years. And for the last three years, we've also been the congressionally designated nonprofit management entity for our two county national heritage area. And that's important words there, congressionally designated. Because unlike the state program where you apply through this, the, the state department of conservation natural resources and the governor ultimately makes a decision whether to designate a heritage area based on a feasibility study and management plan. Congressional designation requires literally an act of Congress, right? You don't become a national heritage area without that. 
we worked for 13 years uh, to seek the national designation because it adds another layer of support and recognition and national identity uh, to a heritage area. And we achieved that in 2019, thanks to great support from Congressman Lloyd Smucker here in Lancaster and York and Senator Bob Casey statewide. And yes, that picture actually shows Bob Casey and Congressman Smucker standing next to each other, smiling. <laughs> Some things supersede partisan politics and heritage areas and economic development and community pride, I think are one of those. And we had a really great celebration down in Columbia in 2019 when the bill passed Congress was signed by the president and we became a designated national heritage area, America's 55th national heritage area. And uh, as a nonprofit organization, uh, we have, by, by our bylaws and by our organization, by our funding, been a two county organization. And I think until the last few years, we were the only one that actually had board members from both counties. Lancaster Conservancy has done great work to reach out to York and bring members in. Uh, the YMCA, I think, merged. You know, so now we're starting to see more regional approach. But for a long time, our organization was one of the few that had uh, two county board of directors, half from York, half from Lancaster. Uh, we were created, we're really a product of the two counties, Lancaster County and York County, coming together through their planning commissions to lead the, the process that achieved state designation in 2001. Uh, there was a feasibility study that was coordinated uh, and a management plan, mostly by Lancaster County Planning Commission. You all know Scott Standish, she's been around a long time, longer than me, uh, twice as long, I think. Uh, I call him the grandfather of the Harry Jerry now because you know, I got more gray hair though. So, um, But it was really a product of working with the two planning commissions coming together, working with Lancaster History, York County History Center, the two visitors bureaus to go through that process and get the designation. Uh, for both counties uh, to be the heritage area. And we were first known as the Lancaster York Heritage Region, actually. Uh, we went through a number of name changes over the years, uh, but really settled in the Susquehanna as being a common identity. Uh, our, our funding, uh, based, you know, a, as the officially designated management entity for a program managed by state and, and national government, we are fortunate to have access to state and national funding through the Pennsylvania Heritage Area Program and the National Heritage Heirs Program. That all has to be matched, and we're fortunate that both counties have stepped up in different ways over the years to provide significant funding to support our work too. And increasingly, as we, especially as we work to expand our role, expand our uh, programs, expand our public facilities, we've uh, started generating much more in the private sector donations and support uh, for our work, as well as earned income uh, from programs and, and, and events and things we can do. Uh, so it's been a really uh, gradual progression, but we went from 250,000 we started, and we're now generally in a $1.2 million a year uh, funding uh, area. And that 20, two county, 20 year partnership also means we've worked with a lot of people, a lot of organizations, uh, and a lot of projects. Uh, I was just gonna highlight a few of them here uh, because they, they go from the local, you work with local partners, state partners, federal partners. Sometimes we do a project on our own, just depends on, on, uh, on, on what, what, comes to, what comes up, filters up through the communities that we decide to work with. Early on, one of the first things we did was help guide and inform visitors along the Susquehanna how to paddle the river and learn about the river's history. Uh, 2000, the first year we were in existence, really, as an operating organization, we installed 25 interpretive panels up along the Susquehanna at public access points. You'll, they're still there. They're, they're actually amazingly in decent condition, although we're gonna to need to start a process to refresh them soon. Uh, but that was a way to inform people about the history along the river. We also produced a map and guide, which is still for sale to this day, it's in second edition, a water trail map and guide so you can paddle the river from Harrisburg to the Maryland line, um, and really engage with the Chesa what's called the Chesapeake Bay Gateways Network, which includes communities and, and areas up and down the major tributaries of the Chesapeake to talk about the common stories of the river and the, the bay and its major rivers. We also started off right off the bat working with Sheffy, uh, marketing here in Lancaster originally, uh, promoting Lancaster and Harrods, uh, Harrods and outdoor tourism across both counties through a, a website organized around themes. We created an orientation exhibit, which you can still view today at the Turkey Hill Experience. When you, how many have been to Turkey Hill Experience? Okay, if you've got little kids, you probably, or, or grandkids, you've been there. Uh, but when you first go in there, the free part, before you actually go through the ticketed part, you'll see this exhibit about our common shared heritage of Lancaster, New York. That was created through our original work as a heritage area and installed, I think, in 2011 
uh, right about the time they opened up the, the experience. We also uh, were, were thinking far ahead, and we came up with these wonderful digital way stations. This little the picture of this vertical thing standing there, uh, where you could touch the screen and you could pick locations and create your own itinerary. And we launched them, and I think in 2006. And when did the iPhone come out? 2007, right? I think uh, these became obsolete <laughs> very quickly. You know. You didn't need a touch screen in a restaurant or a visitor center to go find your stuff. You could just pull out your phone. But it was interesting how the technology just changed. This was cutting edge when we started working on it in 2003. And by 2007, eight, the phone had taken over. And, you know, I use my Google Maps for everything now. So uh, we also you know, had brochures and guides and things about local history. We got involved in some important projects for the, the region and the two counties. One of the for earliest, and it took 12 years, I think, yeah, 12 years to restore the historic lights on Veterans Memorial Bridge. We put the bridge on our logo from the very beginning, and we actually put the historic lights on the logo from the beginning, even though they weren't there, because we started working with Rivertown's PA USA, an all-volunteer group led by Claire Storm at the time in Columbia, and we worked and worked and worked to eventually uh, be able to get historic lights put back on that bridge. And it's become an iconic, the bridge has always been iconic, but with the lights on it and that installation of those, it, it restored a pride to our, our region and our communities. Um, we also made a movie, uh, working with Aurora Films and Music from here in Lancaster, uh, to create a story, uh, a really high definition, another cutting edge thing. I remember uh, Aurora Films saying, I want to do it in film. And they said, no, we want to do it in high definition digital. That's the way of the future. I said, no, I really want film. No, high def we did it in high definition digital. It's still fresh today. <laughs> And we, we did a 15-minute orientation film to the common history of Lancaster counties and the Susquehanna River that debuted at the two uh, history centers in New York and Lancaster. It was at the visitor centers. It's, it's still online. It's amazing how it hasn't got that old. I mean, the only thing I, think, I see in it is Penfield Feeds uh, Tower. Doesn't, you know, that doesn't say Penfield Feeds anymore. <laughs> but, um, but it really, I think, if you, you go to our website, go down to the bottom of our homepage, and you can watch the movie. It's really cool. I think still captures the shared heritage of our region. We also, you know, we call that stories of the land, but we also got early on involved in saving some important landscapes along the river, particularly early on, that led to the creation of High Point Scenic Vista and Recreation Area, still one of the most wonderful places to get a 360 degree panorama of the river. And pretty much you're looking at Lancaster County when you're up there. Uh, and Native Lands County Park over New York side also, which is a 180 acre park that saved the last village site of the Susquehannock Indian community that lived here in the 1600s. Uh, and now we're able to use that park as our, our visitor center, I'm gonna tell you about, is right next door, is the gateway to it. And, and thousands of kids have now gone into the park to learn about that history and heritage. And we joined with uh, Pennsylvania DCNR, Lancaster Conservancy, Lancaster New York Counties, uh, to, and PPL for what we all, the insiders call the PPL deal. I don't know if you've ever heard of the PPL deal. But you probably have heard of Lancaster Conservancy's success in opening up more preserves and access along the Susquehanna. Well, over 2,000 acres was transferred from PPL almost 20 years, well, 15 years ago now, uh, to serve to be preserved. Some of it's state park, most of it's Lancaster Conservancy lands. Uh, but it was an effort to really save some lands before they could have been sold off and preserve the landscape of the river. And we were one of the key partners with that. Um, we did various studies in those early years. Uh, one of them, which I, I, I hope and I, I think spurred thought and, and, uh, and helped people realize the potential of our river towns, Wrightsville, Columbia, Marietta, to revitalize themselves through heritage and outdoor tourism. And we, we did the heritage development strategy back in 2008. So it's amazing how time goes. That's 14 years ago. <laughs> um, and, you know, it had specific recommendations that had, uh, you know, actions and things, some of which have been implemented, some of which have not, some of which turned into something else. But I think the thing that's most important about that document is it got people thinking about that potential of the river towns. Now, if you go to Columbia on a weekend or Marietta on a weekend, go on the Northwest River Trail, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's worked. It's not all because of the plan, but I think people in the communities were able to visualize that they could be stronger and more uh, healthy economically and better places to live uh, through strategies we include in that plan. About the same time as we were doing a lot of those projects, we had a wonderful gift to us that I think really kind of set a series of positive dominoes uh, 
that uh, led to much, uh, really a transformation of our work. Uh, the John and Catherine Zimmerman of Mount Wolf had finished renovating this historic home, the Dritt Mansion, down at Long Level on New York side. Uh, we rented some space in there from them for a couple of years, and then they called us up and said, we want to give it to you. Uh, we'd like you to make an educational facility. It's right next to Native Lands Park, and that could be a great gateway to the park. We thought about it for a couple minutes. <laughs> Our board, we, we did have a board meeting. It was very positive. We accepted the gift. And that's riverfront, so, you know, that's a drone photo from above the water looking at the building, which is across the street from the Susquehanna. And that gift started a whole series of things. We, we initially sought grants and, and private donations to transform the property into a true visitor site. It had been a residential home, basically, that it was nicely renovated, but not really set up for visitors. And we, we were able to secure and, and put together a package of about a million and a half dollars worth of improvements outside the house to add parking, to add an ADA accessible walkway, interpretive panels, a trailhead to Native Lands Park, a kayak launch, um, a waterfront pavilion, and a dock, which at the time I didn't, you know, let's have a dock, we're on the river, we want visitors to come visit us. And then I really re realized later that it actually works better to get people on a boat and take them from that dock onto the river, which I'll talk about in a minute. But John and Catherine gave us that gift. It was used to match uh, preservation of another uh, 100 acres of land just up the river, that uh, part of which the Lancaster Conservancy manages this Wilton Meadows uh, Nature Preserve now. Um, it, it started, I, I, I brought National Park staff to the, to the property right after we finished the improvements, and they said this looks like a national park. That led to new partnerships with the Park Service. Uh, John and Catherine's gift really started us uh, on a path that I think expanded our role as a heritage area. A lot of heritage areas kind of work in the background, support others, don't actually provide direct visitor services or programs. Uh, but that gift started us down that road, and I think it's been really positive uh, for us. Uh, and it's also gave us credibility. You know, from an, you come to this building and you meet, we started having Chesapeake Bay meetings there, national park meetings, state conservation meetings there, PPL land deal meetings. And it really kind of helped us uh, advance too. And at about the same time, our board went through a strategic planning process and we decided for the, at least it, it's been 14, 12 years now, no, 14 years now, a new strategic plan that would primarily focus our efforts on the river corridor in both counties, but pull back in a little bit because at the time there really wasn't an organization taking the lead on the river in a lot of ways, you know, working both sides. There were small groups here and there, but there wasn't somebody looking at the whole river. And we went through a process that said we envision the river and the riverlands as a national destination for heritage and outdoor tourism. Like we have a national park right in our own back backyard, even though it's not called that. And if we invest in it, we invest in placemaking to enhance the quality and appeal of the places along the river and the facilities. We invest in tourism development to increase the visitor uh, visibility and the readiness of the river. It could really be cool, you know, and this could be important for our region. Uh, and of course, we need, we need to improve our own visibility, our own viability and capacity to do all that. But it set the stage for what's happened over the last 14 years. And a big part of that was the fact that, you know, the river isn't going anywhere. I mean, the river's flowing, right? But it really isn't going anywhere. It's, it's there, at least for our lifetimes. It's definitely going to be there. And I, I remember I was at a Lancaster Chamber event back in about 2008, 2009. And, it, and the state had brought a consultant in to talk about economic development along rivers and recreation. And Harley-Davidson plant in New York was thinking of leaving at that time. They were talking about closing the plant, taking all the jobs, and moving them to another state. And I remember the guy saying, you know, Harley could leave tomorrow but the river isn't going anywhere. <laughs> you know, if you protect it, you invest in it, you enhance it and, and, and promote it properly, it can be an ongoing in perpetuity asset for the region. And that, that's always stuck with me. Um, and it is, it is a shared asset between our two counties, even though I know all the waters in Lancaster County. I learned that very quickly when I moved to Lancaster County. <laughs> And it's, you know, we had some legislators on a boat cruise of, of back in August, and boy, the, the Lancaster legislators, Speaker Cutler and Senator Martin, were really razzing the York legislators about, you know, you're in Lancaster County, you know, because they're on the boat. Uh, but it is a shared asset, uh, and it's also a shared asset by the state and our nation. Uh, but the river is a habitat. You know, it's a source of water for people and, and animals. Uh, it's a source of water for power. That power generator has long attracted industry. 
that is attractive. Transportation, all those things for, you know, for almost 200 years, the river was really an industrial quarter, an industrial center. But increasingly, every, folks are realizing the river is an asset for recreation, a place for learning, and coming to appreciate our heritage more and our area more. And I think that's, uh, that's really the growth industry along the river. Um, the river is also the mother of the bay. And I've spoken to a few Chesapeake groups like the Chesapeake uh, Bay Commission and others and remind them, you know, the bay is basically the drowned river, right? So when you talk about the bay, you're really talking about the Susquehanna River. Uh, you know, that ship channel that goes up the Chesapeake Bay so the big ships can get to Baltimore, you know what it is? It's the Susquehanna River underwater. That extra depth is where the river was before the bay actually was created. Uh, so we obviously, uh, with that direct impact of the river and the bay, we're not an environmental protection agency. We're not you know, the leaders in clean water and all that stuff, although we support all that. But if we can help raise awareness of that connection, the importance of the river to the bay, the bay to the river, and it's, it's a shared asset also, uh, we think it's important. So we've been involved in a lot of Chesapeake Bay programs, and the National Park Service particularly has a number of great programs that John Smith, Captain John Smith's Chesapeake National Historic Trail and the Chesapeake Bay Gateways Network that uh, provides uh, technical support and funding to do things up here uh, that have been important uh, for our region. But all this, you know, coming back to the Pennsylvania Heritage Air Program, economic investment, economic development through heritage and outdoor tourism, we really started realizing and trying to promote the fact that the river as a visitor destination can be an ongoing source of economic development for our region. You know, we get about 10 million visitors to our two counties, most of them to Lancaster, the Amish traction is still strong and Discover Lancaster does a great job of promoting that. York still attracts two to three million visitors a year. If you put it all together, we're attracting 10 million visitors to the region. Uh, if we can get just 5% of those visitors, half a million people to spend one more day in our region, stay in a hotel, eat, shop, rent a kayak, rent a bike. That's, you know, I use a Pennsylvania Dutch conservative figure of $200 a day. Uh, Ed Harris from the Discover Lancaster said we could probably up that maybe now to $250, $300. If you stay overnight, it's, it's a lot more. But on average, I use $200. You know, that's, that's still, you know, I don't want to over-exaggerate. But even if, you, if those half a million spend $200 a day, it's $100 million of spending in our region that goes here. It doesn't go to the Smokies or Katy National Park, where I like to go sometimes, uh, or other places. It's spent here in our region. And so that's every year. So if we do this right over the long term, it's good for everybody. So making that visitor destination uh, as a heritage area, we've supported the Susquehanna Riverlands uh, initiative that's led by the Lancaster Conservancy. We've supported the PPL deal. We supported small organizations, all those things. But we also made a conscious decision to insert ourselves in as providing a visitor experience too. Uh, and that started at that Zimmerman Center for Heritage that was gifted to us. Uh, and since we uh, improved it and started doing programs there, we generally get about 5,000 visitors a year to the building. That's pre-COVID. It's, it's interesting, obviously it went down a little bit during COVID when we, the building wasn't open, but now it's, it's coming back. Not a lot. But people still think Long Level's like some wilderness place. <laughs> you know, it's six minutes south of Wrightsville. You know, eight minutes from the exit at Route 30. So it's not that far. But it, it, it is interesting the perception that it's far out. But we get five visitor, thousand visitors actually make their way down there. Uh, we have a one of a kind river art collection, the only permanent collection of Susquehanna River art in, that exists on display. There it was the first exhibit we ever put up there. What, our partnership with the National Park Service, the John Smith Chesapeake National Historic Trail, has led us to now host. National Park Service Junior Ranger Programs. We have, actually have a National Park staff member who works in our building. That's her workstation. And she works with our staff to create Junior Ranger programs for kids and families. Uh, we've had over 2,500 fourth graders for field trips since 2016. And that's not counting the two years we didn't do it because of COVID, <laughs> because there were no field trips in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we would be over 3,000, uh, 3,500, it's about 500 kids a year come through our field trips there from both counties. We, we reach out and partner with Title I schools that have uh, you know, certain economic uh, challenges, invite their fourth grade classrooms to come. Uh, it's amazingly in this world, fully paid for. We get a National Park Foundation grant uh, to help pay for the buses. So we, the key thing for field trips is you gotta have buses generally to get places. We can pay for the buses. 
And we also match that with uh, educational improvement tax credit funding from private companies that contribute to us and we can use to support those programs too. So it's really been a wonderful program. What's really neat is when the kids bring their parents back and the kids play tour guide because they've gone through the art collection, they do a scavenger hunt in the art, they go up in the native lands to learn about the Indian history, they do a creek walk and find critters. Um, and, and it's just really a fun day. Uh, uh, when the, it's, it's like an all-day field trip. And they bring their parents back. And since uh, 2000, sorry, I'm tired. We've got, got a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> in 2019, we started doing pontoon boat trips on a 12-passenger on a pontoon boat. They were free because if you charge for a passenger vessel in the Susquehanna, because it's a navigable river in the United States, even though it's not, uh, it's designated as one, uh, you have to have a Coast Guard certified vessel if you carry more than six passengers. So we did free tours for three seasons with grants from the Park Service and the State Heritage Program to see if people wanted to get out in the river. You know, if you don't have your own boat, you don't paddle, you know, you have to go to Harrisburg to ride on probably the Susquehanna. It just goes on a little loop around downtown Harrisburg. It's not that big. Although, wonderful people, great tour. <laughs> it just doesn't go far. Um, so we thought, well, let's try it. And it was overwhelmingly successful. We actually launched it in 19. We you know, had to delay a little bit because of COVID, reduced the capacity, but we continued through COVID. Had over 3,500 people in three seasons, pilot seasons, on, on the little pontoon boat. We uh, hired it from Long Level Marina uh, to see if you know, before we invest in a, in a permanent vessel, really successful. Uh, and now that program has led to this. So I don't, you know, I can't get LMP to do a story about the fact we've been doing, they did a great story about moving this boat here last year. You might've seen it in the papers. They did wonderful coverage. But when we actually started the tours, they haven't run a single story yet. <laughs> uh, Fox 43, Channel 27, the York papers have all covered it. But we got this boat last year. Uh, this is a 1912 Elko electric boat built for Adolphus Bush, the founder of the Anheuser-Busch family, or companies, uh, for use at their summer home in Ostego Lake, New York, in Cooperstown. Have you been to the Baseball of Fame? Baseball of Fame, yes. Two blocks, what's two blocks from the Baseball of Fame? Commissioner? You can still see it. It would be iced over, but it's the beginning of the Susquehanna River. Two blocks from, sorry. Commissioner D'Agostino, you knew that. <laughs> Two blocks of baseball of fame, which I had been to before I knew this. Now, every time I go up there, my kids have all, you know, my son's Boy Scout troop from 102 here in Lancaster, we went to baseball of fame, but first we went to show them the beginning of the Susquehanna River, which is about as wide as this room, maybe a little wider than this room right there, when it comes out of Otsego Lake and flows 400 miles down to here. And I Sorry, I talked with my team. So. Um, when I showed the boys that, we, we got out and said, that's the Susquehanna River. And they said, that doesn't look like the river where we live. It was perfectly clear. You could see the bottom. I said, a lot of stuff goes into that river <laughs> before it gets to Columbia, where we have shown the river to the boys before. So, but the, the river, be, this boat spent its entire life from 1912 to last year on Otsego Lake, the headwaters of the Susquehanna River. And thanks to Shanks Mayor Outfitters, Liz and Steve Winan, uh, they, uh, I'm going to have to speed up here, aren't I? Yeah, so I'm just looking, looking at the clock. So, um, okay. Um, Liz and Steve Winan, if you've ever been to Shanks Mayor Outfitters, they have a family home up on the Seagull Lake. They told us about this boat, connected us to the owner, great great grandson of Adolphus Bush. Thanks to Ann Barshinger of Lancaster for a really generous donation and donations from George and Bambi Long and Doug Hoke in York. We were able to purchase this last year uh, for our tour boat. And thanks to grants from the Park Service and the Harry Jerry program and other support, we were able to bring the boat down here, spent the winter getting it ready. Took a long time to get Coast Guard certification. It's not their fault. It's, they want to be safe. They have a process. We were just doing through it for the first time. And it was a complicated process over the summer. We launched the boat in the river at the end of June, spent a couple of months getting it ready for Coast Guard, and we're able to start, start to sneak preview tours in September and October, run full uh, Thursday through Sunday, four trips a day, public tours on the Susquehanna River. And, uh, wait a minute, let me check my text messages. So will that, is it done now? But it is not done. <laughs> It was going to be done last week, but then we looked at the weather forecast, and it's going to be 75 degrees this weekend. So for tonight, the sunset cruise, as of an hour ago, we still had six tickets out of 12. There's only 12 people on a sunset cruise, 
go to susqnha.org. You can click on the River Discovery Tours, make your reservation right now. Sunday we are, uh, not tomorrow. And it actually probably is good, not tomorrow, because it's going to be windy on the river. We might not have been able to do them. But uh, tonight is a sunset cruise. It's a premium, hour and a half, 50 bucks. You get a Chief Uncas glass, and only 12 people on the boat. You can walk around. It's really cool. There were only six tickets left. Uh, on Sunday, we're doing three Native American history tours, which we did on Indigenous Peoples Day a few weeks ago, sold them out. So we decided to bring them back because this is National Native American History Month, or Heritage Month. So we're going to do three more tours on Sunday. For Sunday, we have eight tickets on the 12 p.m., eight tickets on the 2 p.m., 12 tickets on the 4 p.m. That was an hour ago, too. So, uh, uh, so if you want to experience it, you could still do it on Sunday. Again, we worked with Long Lao Marina, who takes our dock in and out, and they agreed to keep the dock in a couple more weeks so we could uh, do that. The boat's actually going to come out of the water around Thanksgiving uh, when we get our cradle retrofitted and store it for the winter. Uh, next year, uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, fall, we launched fall. This, this was Sunday night, a little chilly, but we had a wonderful sunset cruise. Uh, Sunday night. Um, and next year, we're going to be doing tours May through October. So we'll have a full season, Thursday through Sunday, four days a week. It's a one-hour tour. The normal tour is $20 for adults, 10 bucks for kids, five and free or five and under are free. Uh, so we expect to keep that pricing for next year, too. You can charter the boat. You can have a private tour. There'll be special sunset tours and other tours. Once we, you know, we, we literally got our feet wet this year <laughs> with this boat tour um, and, and figured a lot of things out. And we look forward to offering it next year. In the last eight weeks, we had 82 tours and 1,000 thousand people on the boat, which, you know, I didn't expect in the, in the short time we had it was it being fall, but it really been successful. That's the Zimmerman Center. That's our boat tours. The other way we engage in direct visitor uh, experiences is with the Columbia Crossing River Trail Center. How many of you have been to Columbia Crossing? There we go. More and more and more hands there. Been on Northwest River Trail, you probably have used the restrooms there. The nicest bathrooms on the Susquehanna River are at Columbia Crossing. <laughs> we take care of making sure they stay clean. Uh, Columbia Borough came to us six years ago and said, hey, we built this building. We tried to operate with volunteers. It didn't really work. We need a professional staff. They saw what we were doing at the Zimmerman Center. We have a professional services agreement with Columbia Borough, and they provide some funding. We raise the rest through uh, facility rentals and donations and her National Hair Jair funding and others to, to operate that for the borough. Uh, so when you're engaging with people at Columbia Crossing, that's our staff. And they do a great job. Uh, we host a lot of programs. Before COVID, we hit 25,000 visitors. We're about 20,000 now. It's slowly building back up. The trail was swamped during COVID. The building had to be closed for a couple months, and so it really affected. And that's, uh, that visitation's creeping back up. We've uh, had, this just this year, 20,000 visitors, 700 program participants. We had a, restarted the Summer Youth Adventure Camp for a week-long adventure camp for local kids. Uh, we had 600 local fifth graders just uh, two weeks ago uh, for the annual Canoe Mobile Day, which we, we work with uh, National Park Service and Wilderness Inquiry, a group out of uh, uh, Minnesota, uh, to bring these big canoes down. And we, the kids who go through the fourth grade field trips on the other side of the river, as fifth graders come back in the fall, get in these big canoes, First time on the river for most, even if they live in Columbia or Wrightsville, many of them have never been on the river before. Get them out for this education program, have land stations, it's really cool. And we do a lot of facility rentals, a lot of weddings, receptions, have a beautiful deck. So if you need a place for an event, we're cheaper than a lot of places. Um, so uh, the other thing Columbia Crossing, our staff there does, is really they act as the concierge for the river recreation. So if you, if you want to know how to access a trail, where to get a, put, take your bike, where to get your uh, uh, kayak in the water, uh, you can go down there. Uh, we, we publish the trail guides for the, the West, uh, Northwest River Trail, the old low grade trail, which just opened the second trestle. Uh, so now you can ride continuously across Lancaster County from Turkey Hill all the way to At Glen, and particularly to Quarryville. It's in great shape. It's being worked on on the east part. Uh, but we, we provide the guide for that. And we've also helped participate and guide planning programs for how to connect the gap between Northwest River Trail and Noah low grade. It's going to take a while, but it'll get done eventually. So our staff there really does a lot of work with the trail development uh, along the river. Um, they also started during COVID, which has now become an organization, ongoing organization program, the River Roots a blog, which tells the untold stories of the Susquehanna. Uh, this is available on our website, or if you like us on Facebook, you'll, you'll get the links. Uh, but it really started, has delved into the, the heritage along the river, and I think it's become a very popular 
program of ours. Uh, this year, we also had a very busy year with river-based programs for kids and families. Again, we had a number of programs delayed because of COVID that we had funding for, but we couldn't do during the, uh, the COVID period, which we, we got started and launched this year. We had guided river paddle trips. We had a National Park Service junior, ang junior angler fishing program uh, for kids to learn to fish. Uh, and our staff at Columbia, Hope Byers, if you know Hope, uh, revitalized the River Fest, which is the festival for all uh, for Wrightsville and Columbia, commemorating the bridge burning in 1863. They revitalized that with new programs, heritage tours, paddle the battle run where you carry dynamite across the river in your pa in your kayak. Um, I mean, I just let them go. You know, they just it's like what? Okay, sure. <laughs> you know, sounds cool. Um, but it brought it, it kind of refreshed a, an event that had kind of become a little stale over the last 20 years and it's going to be even bigger next year. So, so that's been great. Uh, what's coming? Uh, and I got the most important part. I lost my clock. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> 10 minutes to tell about the big stuff. Uh, no, I mean, everything I, I, I try to give you a little bit of like what we've done, what we're doing with visitor and then what's coming as part of that national designation we got three years ago. Part of the Act of Congress says that our organization has to lead development of a management plan for our National Heritage Area within three years and get it approved by the Secretary of the Interior. And then that plan becomes our blueprint for how we're going to focus our energy for the next 10 to 15 years, which is our authorization from Congress. Uh, so we obviously started this, got ready to start this just before COVID. <laughs> and then we had to like go to virtual meetings and a lot of other ways to engage people. But we completed the management plan over the summer, submitted to National Park Service Philadelphia office uh, in September. They've already recommended approval to the Secretary of the Interior. So it's now in DC as of yesterday. And we hope to have that approved. And once that's approved, then we have a, a, a sort of our official mandate on what we're gonna focus on uh, going forward. And it's gonna reach beyond the river because we're going, kind of going back to our roots as Lancaster York Heritage Region, working across both counties. With the National Heritage Area, we'll be reaching out to preservation organizations and heritage organizations and communities beyond the river too uh, to provide support as, as outlined in this plan. And we'll have more funding to do it. When you get the National Heritage Area Management Plan approved, the funding typically goes up from about $150,000 a year to $500,000 a year. And that, allows, that will allow us to have a grant program so we can provide grants to local organizations to, to, to advance the nationally important stories of our region, which the plan really fleshed out from a lot of conversations from organizations, individuals, and public input that our, our heritage, our two counties, the nationally important stories that rose to the top here, the river's still front and center. You know, the river has really shaped this place and its people, shapes what, how we live on a day-to-day -day basis, even if you don't know it. It provides us water, provides us great agriculture, great industry, great recreation. The river has shaped this place. Uh, you know, for a long time, it was America's frontier. Uh, if you cross the river to York, you were, you were kind of a risk taker, maybe a little outcast probably. The nice people stayed in Lancaster, right? And that's why as a Yorker, I say, York's a little rougher, you know, because that's who went across the river, right? I came from that stock. I had Brenners from Lancaster County though too. So, uh, so anyways, uh, the river is front and center to our identity, our history, our region. And through this process, it's a nationally important story that we're gonna focus on telling with ourselves and our partners, the native <laughs> landscapes, the American Indian story here, and how important it was to the, the American Indian culture nationwide, how it led to uh, our own uh, English uh, settlements in, in the community and why we, why English, white people settled here too. Same reason the Native Americans settled here. Water, food, beauty, uh, river, transportation. That native landscape story is one we wanna highlight more. Creating an American identity is about how our region for a long time and to this day continues to be cutting edge in, in technology and new innovations. Going back to the Conestoga wagon and the Pennsylvania rifle, uh, all kinds of things have come from our region and spread across the country. So we wanna highlight that. And our region has been, has played a huge role at key turning points in our history. Whether it's the American Revolution and York sheltering the Continental Congress from the British in Philadelphia, Lancaster did it for a day, but they wanted that river <laughs> between them and the British. So they were in York for nine months. Uh, the role we played in the Underground Railroad, a significant story, starting to be told much better, but there's a lot of work to do. The role our region played in the Civil War. You know, if the bridge hadn't been burned on June 28, 1863, the longest covered bridge in the world from 
Wrightsville to Columbia, was burned, stopped a Confederate advance. If that hadn't happened, Gettysburg would just be a little town along the Lincoln Highway, and that battle would have taken place somewhere else. Instead, we, we provided Gettysburg with an economic development strategy for 200 years, <laughs> 150 years. But we need, to, we need to take that part of the story back. You know, that, that was a key turning point in the Civil War uh, right here. So we're going to do that. And we're going to support our two-county network of interpretive sites. We have a wonderful network of rich heritage sites and cultural sites in our two counties. We'll be able to do that through the National Heritage Management Plan. And finally, the biggest story, uh, which I'll do in three minutes. Is that what I'm yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, even with all this time, I still talk fast. Um, this opportunity, this, the Mifflin, anybody here of the Mifflin Farm? Over in, it's, on right, it's in Wrightsville. It's on the other side of the river. Yeah, well, yeah. Art, you know. <laughs> Best you know the Mifflin Farm. Um, this opportunity came to us in the last five, six years uh, to, to really save an important heritage place and create a new visitor destination for both of our counties. Um, and so we are currently working, uh, have been working with Preservation Pennsylvania and the Conservation Fund, a national group, and local community members and, and Wrightsville and Hellam Township to create what's we're going to be, uh, it's going to be the Susquehanna Discovery Center and, and Heritage Park at the Mifflin Farm. So this picture, you see Route 30 there, right? You drive by this all the time. It's 90 acres just along Route 30 on the south side of the road. And you go by and you don't even know it's there. Uh, if you've ever been to Wrightsville, there's a rudder store. Look across the street, that's the Mifflin Farm. Uh, it was uh, going to be uh, surrounded by warehouses that were going to expand the warehouses already there originally, and with the warehouse market changing, the developer was going to change that, build bigger warehouses, tear down the historic house and barn. And a, a local grassroots group kind of raised the alarm. And we entered into a couple years of negotiations and process with the developer and, and the landowners, which is a local farm family, and were successful in saving the property. And it's really important to save it because it's got amazing stories. First of all, that Civil War battle we just talked about, burning the bridge, before the bridges burned, there was an hour and a half battle on this farm and surrounding areas between Union defenders, including African-American mill workers from Columbia that came over to help defend the, the line, and injured soldiers, uh, militia. It was kind of a ragtag group held off the Confederates. Uh, I think it was 1,500 Union defenders and 3,000 Confederates for an hour and a half. The cannons were set up on the front lawn of this house, lobbing shells into Wrightsville until the Union had to retreat and burn the bridge to stop the defeat. So the landscape is hollow ground from the Civil War days. But even before that, it was a key place in the Underground Railroad, the Mifflin House itself. Here's the house, built about 1800. Susanna Wright Mifflin, Susanna Wright of the Wrights of Columbia, and the Mifflins of Philadelphia, uh, married, built a house in 1800. And for 40 years, it was a station on the Underground Railroad. There's documentation of folks that came here, came up from Maryland, hit out here, were shepherded across the river by boat by white and black residents of Wrightsville and Columbia, uh, came across to row them across. Even when the bridge, the first bridge was built in 1815, it was still safer to cross by boat because enslavers came up from Maryland and other places to try to capture people with the bridges. So it has a really rich history as part of the Ingram Railroad, and we didn't want to see that loss. Uh, it has a really historic barn. The barn, the main part of the barn was there during the Civil War battle. The, the L-shaped part was built in the 40s as a dairy barn. So it's got a really historic barn that's kind of a blank canvas uh, of space. Uh, and the landscape is really cool. You know, this is, again, right next to Route 30, you know, and it's very accessible right off the exit. Uh, so we started, you know, originally we were trying to just save the place. And our board started having discussions. We decided, you know, maybe we should take the lead and make a new place for the entire National Heritage Area to celebrate both what happened on this property at Denver Railroad and and Civil War, but make it the gateway visitor destination for both counties, the whole region. Uh, like when you go to a national park and there's a visitor center, we could do that here. And we could then send people out to Lancaster and York counties and down, up and down the Susquehanna River uh, to learn more and find out more places. So the concept plan uh, here is about 87 acres of land. Uh, we would make the barn into the Susquehanna Discovery Center, move our offices out of the Zimmerman Center up there too. That'll give the Zimmerman Center more space to do interpretation and programs. Uh, restore the house as an Underground Railroad Learning Center, create an Underground Railroad Heritage Trail to the river, where, you know, again, serendipity, 11 years ago, a guy named Paul Dellinger, uh, developer in Helm Township, uh, called us up. He was dying of cancer. 
He said, I have four acres at the river at the end of the Route 30 bridge. I want to make sure it's preserved. Would you take it? We took it. Haven't done much with it. It's been holding it. We talked to the township about a park and things. But we hold it, and it's only 800 feet from the Mifflin property. So suddenly, we are able to create a trail where you never experienced what people escaping slavery did on that walk to the river. But you can get some sense of it, some amount of the history of it when we create that trail. So it all kind of came together. And we're actually reserving eight acres because, again, we're about economic development. And we also want to have a way to fund all this. Eight acres right across from Rudders to eventually be developed for hospitality development, hotel, restaurant, things that could be attracted by the visitor center, bring economic development to Wrightsville, which has very little remaining undeveloped land. It's very important to them that they have some taxable property. And it'll complement everything we do. And the, the revenues from that can help pay for the acquisition development of the center. So that's the plan. Uh, the, the house, thinking about the Integrated Learning Center, it's just at the very beginning. We have just some sketches and, and ideas. We're, we have a steering committee we're engaging uh, to, uh, to support that and participate in planning that. It's going to take a while to do that right. Uh, we're much further along with some concepts for the Discovery Center because we did these early on to sort of sell the project. Uh, and it, it has attracted, uh, the property's been purchased by five, for five and a quarter million dollars all of which is either secured, in place, or coming. Uh, and so we were able to really paint this vision and attract funding for acquisition. We still have a $10 million lift or more to develop the whole project. But we think it's going to be really exciting to transform the barn into this, this visitor center with sort of the history of the barn, with new additions and innovative architecture. Inside, use the spaces you know, with main exhibits where you get introduced to those nationally important stories of the heritage area, and you learn where you can go out and actually experience them in person. Uh, places for programs and river art, uh, partner offices, our own offices and, and convening space, uh, and underground railroad special exhibit space too. The coolest feature of the whole project, I think, is the silo lookouts. There's a huge, there's two silos, and one of them, the architects feel, can be transformed uh, as a circulation space. The silo will become the stair, we we'll an elevator tower, and we'll be able to provide these viewpoints out over the landscape at different points. And when you're up at the top, you'll be able to see the river. Um, and you'll be able to look at that Civil War battlefield and the Grand Railroad and everything else. Uh, when it's all done, it's not going to have that much impact on the landscape. We're going to try to keep all the parking lots and all that stuff over close to the barn area, which is right next to the industrial park. So the landscape itself will be preserved, become a place to explore and learn, and we think be another way to keep people not here for one day, but two days or three days or even a week, you know, and imagine that economic impact. So I won't go through all this. Some of it I already talked about. Next three to five years, we've got a lot to do. <laughs> Build on all the other stuff I just talked about. Implement the manager plan. Uh, you can support us. That 25% that 20, of private giving, extra give is, when is, who knows when extra give is? Yeah, the 18th, right? Two weeks, two weeks from today, right? We're eligible to receive your generous gifts through the extra gifts. So my development director would want me to make sure I say, please give, please give freely. We, we'd love to have extra support uh, through the extra give. Um, and you can visit us online at susqnha.org. It's our website. Uh, and thank you. And that's what it looks like when you're on the boat. So, All right. Maybe five minutes. We'll give a pause, give Mark a chance to catch a breath. Already got a question. <laughs> um, yeah, we have, a few, we have about 10 state questions. We have one back here. I'm just going to give you this so the folks on the live stream can hear you. Thank you. All right. Um, I have uh, one question about this. Uh, I think the farm sounds very exciting. And in looking at um, historic properties, destinations, bringing people to the county. But I'm wondering about the, um, the potential for Re uh, for investing in the next generation, in the next generation. I'm thinking of organizations like Habitat for Humanity. Um, uh, thinking about the homeless situation, um, food, et cetera. This is a farm. Is there any capacity, any way that there can be an investment in feeding people, training people, um, uh, more or less having historic property invest, not just in the history of the past, but in the making of history for the future? That's a great question. Uh, and, you know, there might be some opportunity to do some level of farm activity on the site. One thing that's unique to the kind of funding streams that are, you know, we're able to access to save land like this is it's for, it's for public access, recreation, and nature, right? So if you're going to run a farm, these funding streams aren't available to acquire land to run a farm. 
But as part of the interpretive side of it, we, we may be able to do something like that. But the great news, if you haven't, if you haven't, maybe you've seen it on the Route 30, but you haven't been there yet, is just down the road, like five, four minutes down the road, is the Horn Farm Center for Agricultural Education, right? Right along Route 30. I was founding member of their board 20 years ago. <laughs> they have grown into this, doing exactly what you, you just talked about. There's a community garden, there's educational programs on how to do farming at home. They have a, fa a small farm incubator program where people come there, farm part of that site, learn how to do it, and go off and buy their own farm. Uh, they do a farm market, they do the Paw Paw Festival, which is you know, really cool. <laughs> Uh, and they actually made, had Paul Paul Beer at an event I was there recently, which was good. So, you know, that's like kind of their core mission um, and, and why that farm was preserved too. But, uh, you know, there's probably opportunities as we move forward. To... And I, I just want to follow up. I spent 20 years in the Hudson River Valley. Uh, yeah. With, um, the farm to table and... stuff is really big up there, right? Well, so agriculture. Also from historic properties. Um, we... Um, in the 1980s, we thought that people were just going to come. Each year, there were going to be more and more and more people visiting the region. And what inevitably happened is perhaps what we should have guessed would happen, which is at some point it was going to level off, and that those historic properties, the ones that would survive, survive, like, you know, the, the, the strongest right. survived, and others sort of fell to the wayside or they merged or they disappear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious if, if we're all putting the eggs in one basket, the historic properties, the historic experience, um, is there a danger or the studies that you mentioned about um, a decade or two ago, did, did they take that into consideration? Did they look at other historic regions around the country <clears throat> and recognize that at a certain point there is a leveling off? Well, I think there was definitely a recognition. I know in the, in the facilities we run, uh, we're not running house museums. House museums are not sustainable anymore, right? You, a, a few, you know, the really well, important. Ones. To the executive director of the house museums to get their done. Well, a few are, are, but one of the things we found, like with the Zimmerman Center, is it's part museum. It's a river art gallery. It's a it's a field trip school field trip program center. It's a visitor center. It's a place to take a boat tour. It's where we work and do things beyond the river. So it's an office. And if you bring all those kinds of rules together in a place, you can sustainably, it's like adaptive reuse of an historic building for business purposes. You know, if you, you can creatively use the historic site, maintain it and keep it and still do, do stories and, and, and interpretation there. Uh, some like this is at a right mansion in, in Columbia, if you have it, that's a house museum. And it could be sustainable it needs to be promoted better it needs to be more accessible but those kinds of things are, are you the new guy yes i, am. I have not met you so oh i, I, I did not know that sure you were doing fine. but to that point i just want to make sure we why, why don't you guys catch up after yeah i i would i i've been wanting i think this is a valid concern if you i've been wanting to meet you too so this is good making sure that there is enough to sustain all. Right, and I, and, and I guess the closing point on that, for, I'm happy to talk afterwards because I really have wanted to meet you, so <laughs> we're five minutes apart, um, is that um, we think the National Heritage Area designation, the state designation, have brought more resources to the trough, right? So that we can share it more and help support organizations and do the right thing. So I hope that's gonna, over time, you know, translate to lots of great support and sustain all the all the sites. Some of which, you know, I think do have a, you know, can be more creative, you know, inter, you know, kind of multi-use kind of places. And others are strictly about telling a particular story and the resource that's there. So, but excellent. Hi. Yep. Um, has there been any consideration to bring a bike share to Columbia River crossings? Um, and if so, has there been any connection to, for example, the city of Lancaster to bring a bike share hub to Columbia? Um, I have to ask Hope Byers, our director, if that's been discussed. I mean, I, I think generally, I think, you know, any way to provide people access to get on the trail and, and things. We were fortunate there's an outfitter, you know, right there at Columbia Crossing who rents bikes, you know, that can provide bikes to folks that don't have access to them or don't want to bring them down there. So we have that business operating already to provide that kind of thing. But I know bike share is different. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I think that's a great, a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. What other questions do people have for Mark? We have one or two in the audience. 
Anyone else? Um, great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure you. Mark will stick around if people have some more questions. Thanks for sharing about Say hi and then I'll. <laughs> yes. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I didn't bring up my date for my. Um... Yeah. Thank you all so much for attending. Um, today's a video of t a recording of today's talk will be on our website and YouTube channel sometime next week. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all at our December 1st Friday Forum. So thanks. Have a great weekend. Right, thank you.